Hey, thanks for joining us this morning. I'm super excited to get to preach to you from 1 Timothy today. This is our fifth Sunday in 1 Timothy. Next Sunday will be our last. Let me hear an aww. But, but don't be too discouraged because I'm going to go right into 2 Timothy right after that. I, I did some research before I started this series, and I thought I had preached 1 Timothy uh, years ago, and lo and behold, my memory is not good, I'm aging, and I hadn't, and uh, I have not preached through 2 Timothy, which I'm super excited about. I actually preached that as a kind of a five-night five revival kind of thing at camp to about some fifth and sixth graders, and we had the largest uh, response. I, I guess we just kept playing the invitation to him for hours on, on end. My buddy came forward. We had like 30 people come to Christ through that, or more. I mean, it was like half the camp came forward, and my, my buddy who was the dean said, I don't know what to do with this. I said, I don't either, and, and, and I thought, yeah, we got this captive audience, so I just kept preaching. Lucky for you, you're not captive. Amen? <laughs> I don't know. No, you're not very responsive this morning. Hey, if you're joining us online and you're responding, hey, praise God for you because crowd inside, eh, they're okay. They're, they're kind of chilling. They don't know what to do with this cold weather thing. And, you know, the orange, you know, I, I, I'm just blending in with the decor today. But we're glad you're with us. We're in a series called The Apprentice where the Apostle Paul is basically taking Timothy under his arms and encouraging him as his apprentice. You know, Timothy on his own was a great pastor, teacher, and leader. But Paul is coming to him and, and, and writing to him to encourage him because he had a, a tough assignment. The church of Ephesus was not an easy church. Timothy was a young man, late 20s, early 30s, church leader in Ephesus, overseeing many house churches and churches in that community. That was not a Christian community, but anti-Christian, anti-God, and worship the god Artemis or the goddess Diana, which I talked about. You can go back in previous messages on YouTube or Facebook or whatever you're watching it on and watch those. But today we're going to look at Timothy or Paul encouraging Timothy in his leadership capacity and and I think leadership in the Christian community is super super important everything rises and falls on leadership your leaders are the lid of what you aspire to be you can break through that but with some challenges leadership is is super important and Paul is sharing three principles for great leaders if you want a great leader and you're kind of, you want to be a great leader and you're kind of stuck in a, in a spot, ask yourself the question, what would a great leader do in a moment like this? In, in your situation, in your life, what would a great leader do? Now, the first principle I want to look at this morning is the principle of responsibility. And this is kind of going to surprise you at the way Paul approaches this with Timothy. If you will, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 through 7, follow along with whatever version and apparatus or actual real copy of the Bible that you have. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. Honor widows who are truly widows. How do you get a false widow? I don't know. But if, we'll find out. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents. For this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. Command these things as well 
so that they may be without reproach. Isn't it fascinating what Paul does here? He, he, he first introduces this idea with proper respect and appropriate behavior toward older and younger men and women. And we should do that as, as a family of God. I, I had one of our, our newer attenders said to me, I still can't believe how tr- friendly this church is. This is the friendliest church I've ever been in. And, and I commend you all in being friendly and outgoing and making everyone welcome. But if you'll notice, what Paul says is, older men treat as fathers, younger men as sons, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, to, to encourage them and have relationship, appropriate relationships with them. Now, church is about relationships. It's about being together and being the body of Christ, being the family of God. And that's how we should respond to each other in in respect and in care. And and the the important thing about this is to remember that the only thing we will take into eternity is what? Our relationships People are the only thing that's going to last outside in this life. Nothing you have, nothing else will matter. Our relationships, people are the first thing. And Paul goes then into the care of widows, which kind of blows me away. In fact, when I retire from the church, my my goal is to start a ministry to widows and single parent moms. And it's a ministry of helps that we will do service and what, you know, if a a switch or a fixture or a faucet or something's broken within our means to help them because that is a biblical response. That is who we care for. Now, the Greek word for widow refers to women who are left alone for whatever reason, death, divorce, or desertion. So it could be a single-parent mom. And, but, but here, listen to this. I don't know of a 21st century American church that does this in the exact way the Apostle Paul describes it in 1 Timothy chapter 5. I don't know of anyone who does it this way. Because we are responsible for helping those in need, especially the most vulnerable. And, and so important that we do not take advantage of anyone, but especially taking care of the most vulnerable. So, so do you know the difference between a leader and an, what... A, do you know the difference... What, what the difference is between a leader and an irresponsible person. You know what that is. The irresponsible person says, it's not my job, it's not my problem, let someone else do it. Leader says, if not me, then who? If not now, then when? Leaders do something. Leaders take responsibility. If you're following along in the outline, the first thing is that leaders are able to respond to a situation. John Maxwell says it this way, catalysts, you replace the word catalyst with leader, leaders, are not consultants. They don't recommend a course of action. They take responsibility for making it happen. They take action. Now, Paul highlights three areas where we should help others. And I think this is fascinating because it wouldn't be what you would put on your priority list if you're a, quote, leader. First one is you take care of those closest to you. You take care if you're a child, well, you're a child of someone, but you take care of your parents. You take care of your mother if she's a widow. That's your responsibility. Uh, 1 Timothy 5.8 says it this way, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially for the members of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That is our first responsibility to those that are in relationship physically or actually kin rel- relatives. John says it this way, he says, if, or Jesus says this way, if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Now we need to be discerning as well. Second group, take care of those who can't take care of themselves. Notice this is how Paul describes widows in this passage Verses 9 through 16, he says, Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age. I find two things interesting. 
about this, that they were, were to be enrolled at 60 years of age if they met these criteria, but they were basically dedicated to the Lord. Notice 60 is the dividing point. If you're 59, you're out of luck. <laughs> Let a widow be enrolled if she is not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, she ha has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work, but refused to enroll younger widows. Boy, Paul's kind of harsh. Well, why? For when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry and so incur condemnation for abandoning their former faith. Now, what he's talking about is you don't enroll them and support them as a church and set them apart and designate them because they may want to marry. There may be another course in their life that they want to go. And, and, and so incur condemnation for having abandoned their former faith. That's kind of odd, isn't it? That's what he says. If you set yourself apart for this and then you do that, don't do that. Besides that they learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. So I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, and give the adversary no occasion for slander, for some have already strayed from after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. Now, the Apostle Paul is very discerning, very descriptive, gives a very descriptive uh, what a description of, of who is to be set apart in this group. Now, it sounds a little odd in our day and age, but that is what he was saying to this, uh, this church who was in a pagan foreign culture that was anti-Christ. He was exemplifying a role model and model of type of person. Now, listen, we have opportunities to help lots and lots of people every week as a church body, as a family of God, internally and externally. And, and we have to practice discernment. And as I've grown in my responsibilities in our church over the many years that I've done this, most of the senior pastors have turned this over to me. They, they just get frustrated by the, 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 the folks that come in and need help. And we have a couple organizations that we work through. The food pantry, Clay County Food Pantry, does an excellent job. And we help support them as a church body. And Clay County Benevolence. We work hand-to-hand -hand with them. We do matching, and we help people all the time. But then we have our Finn ministry, our family and need ministry that we help inside the church and also outside the church, if there's ever a need that we know about, we come alongside. Now, I happen to meet with a group of ministers on Thursday afternoons regularly, and we study a book of the Bible. And this week, uh, one of the ministers brought a lady from the Salvation Army. And I've got to be careful how I say this. There, there was this nice little 70-year-old lady, of a, you know, a woman of a certain age, and uh, she was a volunteer for the Salvation Army. She didn't wear uniforms. She wasn't an officer. She said, I'm just a civilian. I'm a volunteer. But she kind of takes care of all the, all the counties in west central Indiana to Indianapolis. Well, not including Indianapolis and all around Indiana and part of Illinois. And we were having this meeting and I was teasing with her and she said, well, you're kind of sexy. <laughs> I know, right? And I said... I get that all the time. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> if you're watching online and don't know me, or if this is your first Sunday, I never get that response. Just so you know, I'm teasing. A little sarcasm. And, and we got to talking, and, and she was there for our whole hour together. And Salvation, uh, the Salvation Army does a great ministry, and we, we don't adequately fund it. And they're looking for people to join uh, and, and help serve in the Salvation Army, Army uh, ministry that they do. And so what they were telling me, I, I mean, I don't know if you've ever been a bell ringer for the Salvation Army. I'm doing the little gesture for bell ring. I don't know if you've ever been a bell ringer and done that, but 
I've done it before, and I've always wondered, I wonder where the money goes. Well, 90% of it stays in our county. 10% goes to, to uh, Salvation Army uh, nationally, and it is funneled back through uh, the communities that are hit by devastation, like in North Carolina and Florida after Helene and, and Milton have hit. Salvation Army is always there. And she was telling us about... Uh, the Salvation Army in Sullivan County, and I thought it was fascinating. They have a very strong Salvation Army presence, and they have a person who takes care of the funds, and it's all taken care of just much, much like the chain of custody we go through with church offerings here. And so, you know, if there's a fire and somebody is without a home or without a, a place to sleep or without food, the, the Salvation Army is always there in Sullivan County, and they say, what do you need? I mean, do you have a place to sleep? Do you need food? Do you need clothes? And, and the check writer will then call this 70-year-old lady who thinks I'm sexy and at 2 a.m. in the morning and will uh, say, yeah, go ahead and write the check and take care of that. That's what happened. Now, last year, remember, uh, not a hurricane, but a tornado hit Sullivan County and uh, devastated, uh, like, I forget, maybe 50 to 100 families. Guess who was there? Salvation Army was first there, helping out all the way through that tragedy. And then money came from National to help with that. And so, so that's the ministry that our 7 a.m. Uh, community prayer men's group is probably going to take on to help establish that for our community and to take care of needs for those that can't take care of their own. And so, and, but at the same time, we've got to be so discerning that we're not entitling and we're not enabling people because the Apostle Paul also writes the Thessalonians and he said, if a man will not work, he shall not eat. And so there also is our responsibility to provide for ourselves, to do as much as we can in, in what God has given us to work and to provide for ourselves. Not entitlement, not enabling. So if a man will not work, he shall not eat. That's harsh, isn't it, in our culture today? Now, the third is to take care of those who take care of you. Paul, is, it's fascinating how his mind works and how he writes. Notice in verse 17 of this passage, he says, The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. And so what Paul is saying is to the elders and the church leaders that if this is what you're called to do, it, you should receive respect, regard, and financial support, which that is what occurs in our churches today. I get paid for doing what I love and what I'm called to do. Now, listen, this is, this is important because you need to provide for guys like me for our church staff and those who dedicate themselves for serving the Lord. Now, I am not an elder. I am a pastor, minister, whatever you want to call me, servant of God that is called to preach and teach. And so the word honor, again, verse 3, refers to respect, regard, and financial support. That's what is to occur. So do you know what the biggest cause of burnout in, in the ministry is? And let me, let me just uh, share this with you because this is why most ministers go into ministry for appreciation. Now, I found that humorous, but, but it's so true. And if you're going to grow in ministry, you know, you're not going to be appreciated all the time. That's just a fact of the matter. And if you're a leader, you're not going to be appreciated very much. Now, I feel loved and I feel appreciated because Gary Delmo gives me a hug every time he sees me. And you're not a hugger. And I'm not a hugger. <laughs> There's something going wrong there. But, but really, I feel loved and I feel appreciated. And, and I hope our staff does too. But it makes a difference when I see you that you, I appreciate you and I see what you do and encourage you in the Lord as well as you do for me and for our staff and for those that serve you. That's so very important. Most guys leave the ministry because they don't feel appreciated. But, but the bottom line is, and again, I love you and I, I feel appreciated, but guess what? I'm not here for you. I serve God, number one. And that affirmation from God should matter more than my affirmation from you. 
And I'm not saying I don't need that. I do. But bottom line is, it has to come from God first. And that's where we find that. Because if, can you imagine Jeremiah or Elijah or Elisha saying to the Lord, I don't get it, God. I prophesy in your name. They don't appreciate me. I don't see that. The Apostle Paul, I don't know. He loved the church tremendously. Timothy loved the church tremendously. But they didn't feed just off of appreciation. They fed off the affirmation of the one on high that ultimately mattered most of all. That drove their sacrifice. That drove their ministry. That drove their calling. Now, one mark of a mature believer is the ability to appreciate what others do and the ability to show it. We need to appreciate and encourage and to inspire one another. So incredibly valuable. So we have responsibility. The second principle is this, the principle of accountability. To be accountable. Look, notice in verses 19 through 21, it says, Do not entertain an accusation against an elder unless it's brought by two or three witnesses. Those who sin are to be rebuked publicly so that others may take warning. I charge you in the sight of God and Christ Jesus and elect angels to keep these instructions without partiality and to do nothing out of favoritism. You see, godly leaders recognize that the rules apply to them just as they do everyone else. The rules apply to me just like they do to you. That's what we've got to realize. There's no special accommodations for sin in my life, nor should they be in yours. Uh, as a staff, years ago, when I was a youth pastor just starting out, I learned in the first church I served, and this was uh, a small church, uh, Agape in South Terre Haute, was where I started in 1980, June 1, 1983. That's a long time ago. And I realized after a, a few months that the elders and the church leaders didn't know what I did. And most of the time, I would tell my pastor, but he wouldn't remember what I did. And so I set up a system that monthly I would write a report of what I was trying to do, what was important, what was on the back burner, how many days off and how many vacation days and what uh, you know, my goals were and if there was anything to pray for me for. And I would give them a report monthly because even if they didn't read it, I could say, remember I told you this back then because it wasn't being communicated up what I was doing. Now today, all of our pastors on staff generate a monthly report. We still do that today. I generate a monthly report. I do the same thing. I submit it to the elders. I give them two weeks in advance. By the way, guys, we probably, it's probably due this Wednesday at noon, okay? Just, I haven't told you yet, but, but it's due this Wednesday at noon. And what we do is we share that. They read through all of that. It's a consent agenda, but sometimes they can hold that out and they can ask questions if they don't understand. But they know what we do. We're accountable to them. Now, I'm also accountable for what I say publicly. So if anybody's offended about thinking you know, that I'm sexy today, you know, just tell an elder and he'll say, hey, you know what? That probably wasn't a good idea. It was funny, but Chris, you're kind of on the line. And I get that every once in a while. We all ought to be accountable. Godly leaders hold others accountable and expect the same from themselves. Have you ever heard the phrase R-H-I-P? It stands for rank has its privileges. Not in Christianity. Not in Christianity. Now, I'm a senior pastor. I have a lot of responsibility. I hold a lot of people accountable. I have to handle conflict and I don't enjoy it. Sometimes I have to... Um, deal with staff and, and unpleasant situations and we work things out or I have to take authority and do things I don't like to do. That's my role. But it doesn't, it's, not, it's not a privilege, it's a responsibility. It's not to take from, it is to give to. That's the idea of accountability. And finally, the third principle is this, 
the principle of inevitability. You're probably not familiar with this. You probably don't hear about this principle of inevitability very often. In fact, it's hard to say. But look at verses 24 and 25 of this passage. The sin of some men are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. In the same way, good deeds are obvious, and even those that are not cannot be hidden. What's Paul saying here to Timothy? He's saying that even if you think you've hidden your sin, it will find you out. Numbers 32, 23 says this way, be sure your sin will find you out. That secret sin will be exposed. It will become obvious. But let me encourage you, your good deeds will find you out too. And so if you're doing good deeds hidden, they're going to be exposed but particularly, our sins will find you out. I was dealing with a situation this last week, and uh, as a landlord, I have some interesting uh, people who want to be my tenants. And I had one tenant who uh, was dealing with a situation, and it was illegal, and he was in the process of being uh, prosecuted for it. And so I was asking about why they were moving and what was going on, and they were not telling me the truth, and I knew it. And so finally, after I talked to them for a while, I said, well, you know you cannot do this in my house, this particular thing that they were doing. And they were just, I mean, their eyes got real big and their mouths dropped, and I said, listen, I, I, I understand. I said, I'm not judging, but that just can't happen. This illegal activity cannot happen in this house. And they withdrew their application. You know, your sins, you can't hide them. And so you might as well repent of them, seek forgiveness, and change your life. Remember that song we sang as little kids that Jesus taught, the parable, the wise man who built his house upon the rock, and the foolish man that built his house upon the sand, and the winds came, and, and the flood came, and the house that the foolish man built on the sand went splat. That is what happens in our lives when we try to hide things. Now, my question this morning is this. Is there an area of your life that needs reinforcement? Is it financial? Is it relational? Is it marital? Is it sexual? Is it spiritual? Whatever it is, come to the Lord. He already knows. He is merciful. His grace is sufficient. And he will forgive you, but also tell someone that you trust to encourage you and hold you accountable that it, that sin might not harm you and your family. Jesus said this in Revelation 3.2. He says, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains, and is about to die. That's what Jesus said to them, he says also to us. Now, in conclusion this morning, just want to remind you of this. In conclusion, godly leaders have this in common. Their lives are founded on biblical principles. The Apostle Paul was reminding Timothy of his responsibility, his accountability, and also as a church leader that, that his sin inevitably would be found out. But do your good deeds in such a way that God is glorified, is what Paul was telling him. And as I encourage you. So what your life is built on will eventually become obvious. Are those principles a part of your life? Will you please stand as I pray? Eternal God and Father, we are grateful for this day and for this moment in time that we can be reminded of our responsibility and the accountability that we need and the inevitability of what occurs in our life and the choices that we make are going to be our legacy of who and what our signature is in our lives. And Father, just now, I just praise God for those who are coming to Christ. I praise you for what you are doing, the work you're doing of transformation in the body of Christ here and the individual work that you're doing in every life. And Father, I just pray your spirit to be strong and mighty, that your presence would be known and be made known 
that others might know you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you come?